So now uh, if you look at operating methodologies in an uh, ABS uh, what are the different choices you know like we will shortly see uh, what are the uh, see there are of course lot of variants you know, and other choices I am just presenting a few samples which are commonly discussed so that we are aware of those terminologies you know that is my objective here. So if we are looking at ABS operation methodologies broadly we look at what is called a single wheel control. So, what is single wheel control? In single wheel control, you know, each wheel obviously is controlled independently, right. So, essentially, we want to look at every wheel independently and then control it. Obviously, what is the advantage results in the maximum braking possible on each wheel right because every wheel can be on a different friction surface right in general. So, if you single wheel control we are going to try and maximize the traction at the tire road interface of each wheel. So, we are going to get this uh, uh, try to maximize the traction available at each wheel right. But what is the flip side? The flip side is that if you have something called as a split mu surface. So, what is a split mu surface? Let us say you know I, I am going on a road surface where let us say the one side is on a dry road, another side is on an icy surface. So, what is going to happen is that if I, I am trying to maximize the uh, traction on the dry road, these braking forces are going to be much higher than what I can generate at the icy surface. So, immediately we can see that there is going to be an imbalance right in the moment all right. So, that is essentially going to may result in a significant yaw moment okay, which can uh, have a yaw which can result in the yaw motion of a vehicle. So, we need to be careful okay. it is not that it cannot be used we have to see you know when it can be used right and cannot. So, can introduce a yaw moment on a split mu road surface. So, that is what is called uh, single wheel control. The second uh, thing is to go very conservative. So, we go for what is called select low control. So, we are saying look hey I do not want yaw at any cost, but what I will do is that on a particular axle the wheel on the lower friction surface will dictate what should be the braking on both sides. So, in other words let us say this surface is on ice right in this case if you consider left and right the right wheels are on ice. So, on let us say we consider the front wheels then the left front wheels traction is also or braking is lowered to the level of the traction available on the right wheel which is on an icy surface. Similarly, since the right rear wheel is on an icy surface we lower the braking done on the left rear wheel to match that of the right rear wheel. So, so there is no yaw moment in a split mu surface, but what is the trade off? We are not utilizing the traction on the high mu surface completely is it not? So, that will result in higher stopping distances because the net braking force is now lowered right at the expense of not having yaw motion. So, in select low control the wheel with the lower traction uh, controls the level of braking on 
both wheels of a particular axle ok. So, the advantage is that no yaw moment significant yaw moment in a split new surface, but the trade off as we just discussed is that the net braking force will be lowered. So, stopping distance will increase, but the traction force on the higher mu surface is not completely utilized. This implies larger stopping distance. So, it depends you know like on what surface we are you know what is the relative levels of traction you know like what is the uh, your moment value which is generated you know all those needs to be uh, factored in right. So, these are only concepts you know like what I am discussing are all only broad uh, concepts, but the decision by the uh, controller the logic should be programmed in such a way that it has to take into account all these uh, various factors right. So, the, the complement of this is what is called select high control right. So, obviously the meaning is clear. So, now if the levels of traction on both sides let us say we have a dry surface and a slightly wet surface as opposed to an icy surface you know are not very high uh, that is the difference in the levels of traction is not very high between let us say the left and the right. Then what happens is that like we go for select high wherein the high friction road surface controls the level of braking on both wheels. So, consequently the net braking force is higher however, there is a possibility that on the lower friction surface since we are applying more braking force than what is possible at the tyre road interface there may be partial wheel lock or some level of momentary full wheel lock. Okay. So, that is a risk that we need to live with. Then when it goes to lock ABS has to intervene and then try to bring it to you know like essentially lower slip values and so on. Okay. So, that is a trade off you know, but the advantage is that the net braking force is uh, increased right. So, that is that is the concept of select high control. Okay. So, the wheel with the higher traction force at the tire corresponding tire road interface decides the level of braking on both wheels of an axle okay that is select high. So, this implies that a higher net braking force of course, we can use it we have to be careful right we can use it if the level of traction on either surface differs by a large amount right. Then what happens is that uh, what essentially we can have an unbalanced uh, uh, moment right. So, uh, which can result in your motion right. So, presence of an uh, presence of unbalanced forces may result ok depends on the level may result in a yaw moment on a split mu surface ok. So, this is what happens in select eye control. Okay, so, these are different uh, methodologies. Now, if you look at the uh, modulator itself, so let us consider the hydraulic modulator okay, so I, or we can just say modulator does not matter. So, we, we are looking at uh, passenger cars you know where we have a uh, hydraulic brake system right as we already uh, studied. So, the modulator essentially acts like a hydraulic link between the uh, 
must master cylinder and the either the wheel cylinder or the actuator in the disc brake. So, if you recall we have wheel cylinder in the drum brake right and a piston cylinder arrangement in a disc brake ok. So, the modulator is placed in between ok in the hydraulic circuit ok. So, typically this modulator can act in three modes. So, the first mode is what is called as an open mode. So, let without loss of generality let me consider the modulator to be placed between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder you know like let us consider a drum brake without loss of generality I can we can argue the same thing with a disc brake also right ok. So, let us say you know the, the modulator is placed in between then what happens is that the link is like this in the hydraulic circuit. So, in the open mode the modulator does not do anything as the name indicates it is open that means whatever fluid is coming from the master cylinder goes to the wheel cylinder once again I am just considering wheel cylinder as an example to discuss the concept. The wheel cylinder can be replaced with a disc brakes actuator also the concept remains the same right. So, in the open mode so the uh, what to say essentially there is a connection open connection between let us say master cylinder and wheel cylinder. So, M C I am using the abbreviation M C for master cylinder W C for wheel cylinder right. The second mode is what is called as a hold mode hold in the hold mode what happens is that the modulator closes the connection between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder. So, the wheel cylinder pressure remains constant right. So, no matter what happens in the master cylinder let us say the master cylinder pressure may increase keep on increasing, but the additional fluid from the master cylinder will be redirected to an accumulator. So, let me put an accumulator in dash line from the modulator just to show that there is an there is another circuit. another component here in the circuit ok. I am putting a two directional arrow we the meaning will be clear shortly right. So, essentially it can either the modulator can take fluid or pump fluid into the accumulator ok. So, what happens is in the hold mode the wheel cylinder pressure remains constant while any fluid which comes from the master cylinder is essentially redirected to the accumulator right. Now, the third mode is what is called as a release mode. So, what happens in the release mode? In the release mode the wheel cylinder pressure is reduced ok. That means that the modulator the still essentially closes the link between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder, but however the modulator also starts taking fluid from the wheel cylinder. So, that the wheel cylinder pressure is reduced and then stores the fluid in the accumulator ok. So, that is how it releases the wheel cylinder pressure. So, from a broad concept essentially how does this system work we, we shall see shortly using a simple schematic. So, thus the modulator works or functions as a hydraulic link between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder ok and wheel cylinder slash brake actuator in a disc brake. it cycles between 
the above three modes I, I would not say cycles it transitions right between the above three modes there is open hold and released okay when ABS action is triggered. by the EC. So, this is what is called like pulsation right. So, in this domain you know like they will say ABS is pulsing or something like that right. So, essentially they uh, that refers to uh, the pulsation we will see what is pulsing okay. So, let me uh, let us uh, let me explain that uh, uh, function by a simple schematic. So, let us consider this figure. So, what is this figure? So, essentially this is a very qualitative schematic to uh, illustrate what is going on. So, this in this figure if you look at the lower half uh, you know brake pressure and time have been plotted ok. So, from the moment the brake is applied. So, this line is the master cylinder pressure. So, it ramps up and then remains constant. So, that is like a typical brake application right. So, the driver presses the pedal the master cylinder pressure increases and then goes to a steady state value right. So, initially there is a small time lag between the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder pressure, but let us say for the time being we are not worried about that. This curve illustrates the wheel cylinder pressure ok. So, initially we can see that both the master cylinder and the wheel cylinder pressure were almost lying on top of one another right they were the wheel cylinder pressure was almost very close to the master cylinder pressure. So, what have I plotted on the above graph this is V ok this is R omega ok. So, V is the vehicle longitudinal speed R omega is the wheels circumferential speed right. Now, what was slip ratio please recall lambda was defined as V minus R omega by V. So, obviously, if the gap between V and R omega increases I should be careful right. So, that is the uh, motivation right. So, during braking there is V is going to be greater than R omega. Now, we can see that starting from this point the gap between V and R omega is increasing. So, at this point the logic triggers the control mechanism or the control scheme has somehow realized you will see of course, that depends on the design of the control scheme ok which we are not going to discuss here right because we have to figure out what is V and how we can accurately determine this gap and so on right. So, let us say we have all those mechanism estimation schemes set up everything right. So, you see that the controller detects that at this point the gap has crossed a certain threshold right. Then what happens is that till here the modulator was on open mode. Then what happens is that the modulator is triggered to the hold mode ok. So, in the hold mode we can see that the drop in R omega has reduced right but still the gap between V and R omega although it is increasing it is increasing at a lowered rate. So, it goes to the hold mode and then it realizes look now I need to go to release because still the gap between V and R omega is large because uh, the wheel cylinder pressure is much higher than that corresponding to the traction force of the tire road interface. So, if we do not take any action the wheel will tend to lock. So, what happens it goes to release. So, it went to hold it went to release. So, when I release the pressure what happens now the wheel speed will start increasing why because we are reducing the braking torque on the wheel right. So, we can observe that the wheel speed has started to increase right and although the vehicle speed is still decreasing ok the vehicle is still being decelerated the wheel speed is beginning to increase and you we can observe that it is going closer and closer to V ok R omega is going closer to V. So, let us say this is my threshold because I want to get to the 
lambda where I get the peak mu right. So, then what do we do? We essentially go to hold first and then if the threshold is reached right for the gap between v and r omega it is in this case this is a lower threshold right. So, once this threshold is reached what happens we go to open mode right. So, open mode means now fluid is pumped into the wheel cylinder. So, the wheel cylinder pressure is increased. So, we can see that the wheel speed starts to low uh, what to say reduce and then the same cycle starts right. If the road traction levels are still low then the wheel circumferential speed r omega starts to move away from v. So, that has to be detected it goes to hold then it goes to release and then hold open so on ok. So, we can immediately see that the modulator is programmed such that it goes in the sequence open hold release then it goes to hold ok then open and the same cycle keeps on repeating ok. So, this people call as ABS pulsing or pulsations in ABS and so on right. So, essentially what they mean by a pulse is this cycle right. So, these this depends on lot of factors ok and most importantly of course, having a good estimate of lambda, but one important thing that affects how fast or how slow we can pulse is the bandwidth of the brake actuator. See we can command whatever we want from the ECU right, but then the actuation system should be able to meet that right. So, that becomes very critical. In a typical hydraulic ABS people have found out that you know like one can pulse around 5 to 6 times a second ok, in an air brake it is even slower right. So, typical hydraulic ABS you know like the frequency of these pulsations is around 5 to 6 hertz by and large you know that is that is what people have found out ok. So, this is how a typical uh, anti-lock brake system will work in concept of course, now the uh, challenges are how do I figure out when to trigger and how do I actually realize it in practice right those are all important practical challenges ok. So, uh, with this I uh, conclude my discussion on anti-lock brake system. So, in the next class what we will do is that like we will look at uh, uh, analysis of brakes ok. So, we did analysis of uh, drive we are going to do analysis of brakes and then we will derive some simple expressions ok. Thank you.